Okay, so grab your Bibles, open up to Galatians chapter 4. We are going to conclude the fourth chapter of Galatians here as we work our way through our series called Rest in the Gospel. I'm dropping guitar picks now, awesome. Okay, so in our series last week, we Paul took an opportunity to revisit the past experiences he has had with the church in Galatia. He kind of recounts his coming to them. He recounts um, what he believes is the true work of the gospel that has been done in their lives. But he is expressing some doubts and some concerns because of where they're believing, you know, where they're falling here. The teachers that they're listening to, they are uh, concerning to him. But as we talked about last week, because of the nature of the gospel, because it is offensive and it is foolish by human standards, he takes comfort in the fact that if they so readily and willingly accepted him and his gospel that he was preaching, then this must have been because of the work of the Holy Spirit on their hearts. There must have been a move of grace by God. But he still has his own doubts, right? He still is concerned because of what he's hearing, what he's seeing their, their beliefs to be centered around. So he is going to now take another history lesson with them. But it's not going to be necessarily a history lesson that, that they were involved in. This is going to be a history lesson of the Jewish people, of uh, the people of God as they have been brought through the redemptive historical narrative. Now that's a big sentence. And you guys have probably heard it said before, but all that all the redemptive historical narrative means is the story of God redeeming his people, right? It's the storyline of the Bible. It's what we see from Genesis chapter 3 all the way to Revelation 21. But in this story, there is a particular time with a particular people that will inherit a particular land that will produce a particular Messiah, right? That's the story of the Jewish people in this story, right? And it begins with Abraham. And it's centered around the promises that God made to Abraham. So uh, Paul is going to go back and he's going to use this as an illustration point saying this is the story. God being faithful to his promise. This is the law of God in its fullness that God has sworn by himself. He has made a covenant with himself. If God is faithful, this covenant cannot be broken. This promise cannot be broken. And in effect, if you have believed this gospel, you are evidence of that promise at work. Only the sons and daughters of Abraham through faith in Christ alone can hope to enjoy the rest promised by God. This was a big thrust of chapter 3. He's now going to repeat it and go in depth. So let's read our passage today in Galatians chapter 4, 21 through 31. And then we'll dig into it. Galatians chapter 4. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. But he who is of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through promise, which things are symbolic. For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But as he who is born according to the flesh then persecuted him who is born according to the Spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what does the Scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be an heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. This is God's Word. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you to receive from your grace, to receive from your word. Lord, every one of us to a degree has our fears and our doubts, and we need to hear from your word that you, in fact, are sovereign. You, in fact, are good. You, in fact, do have a plan, and your plan cannot fail. 
your promises cannot fail. And we come before you to receive of that grace. And we come with this particular passage, which is not the easiest for us to understand and grasp, Lord. But let us look deep in your word to see the plan that you have unfolded and see how that applies to us who believe. And let us proclaim the gospel. Let us proclaim your goodness and your power and your sovereignty to bring your word to pass for your glory, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's be honest, right? Church time, be honest. How many of you read this passage and you're like, I don't get it? You don't have to hold your hand, but it's okay. <laughs> I trick you, Lee. But we read this passage, we're like, okay, I, there's something about a bondwoman, something about a free woman, I, I get it. There's children of promise, okay, yeah. okay. This is one, you know, when we read the Bible, particularly when we read it chapter by chapter, we tend to miss some of the importance and we tend to miss some of the, the things that the author is trying to convey because we read it in a chapter by chapter format. Just so you guys know, and you may not know this, the chapters were not put in the original text. The chapters did not come until the late Middle Ages when people needed clearly defined breaks. Allegedly, they needed them. I don't think we need them. I think sometimes it would be better for you to just read through the whole thing because you'd get a bigger picture. And this is why I encourage people, when they're reading a text, when they're reading a, a, a book of the Bible, some of the best things you can do is not say, I'm going to read a chapter a day. Right? It's like, like, like it's an apple. Like you eat one chapter a day and you'll keep the devil away or something like that. Just read the whole thing. Galatians is six chapters. It's really not that long. You could read this whole book in a half an hour or less. And it would do you wonders to see the big picture if you read it in one sitting over and over and over again. Maybe like once a day, read the entire book, and in a week you'll have read it seven times. And you will know it a lot more than reading one chapter a day for that whole week. Because, yeah, you'll get to the book once. Okay? So this is a very important way to study the Bible so we get big pictures. Because normally, if I'm reading this a chapter a day, I'm going to read through chapter four. Like, well, first half, oh, I kind of get this. I kind of like the first half. Okay, it's good. Talking about the fullness of time, that's good. Okay, okay, what the heck is this? All right, chapter five. Finally, get to talk about me. Chapter five. What am I going to do? How am I going to get the fruit of the Spirit? How am I going to get the, the works of the flesh put down? We skip over one of the most instrumental passages of God bringing about his plan in his sovereign power and in his sovereign timing, and we miss an opportunity to glorify God that only God could orchestrate what God did because we jump. We're like, oh, I don't like this. Don't understand it. Give me chapter five. Chapter five, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has bought you. I got that. I like that. That's about me, right? <laughs> Bible's not about you. Bible's about God. So let's break this down. We're going to do history. So if you didn't get enough sleep last night, now's your opportunity because we're doing history, right? You're all going to fall asleep. But remember, there's less of you. I can see you. I will know if you fall asleep. So we touched on this when we did chapter 3, when Paul was talking about the promises made to Abraham and the history there. But now we're going to delve particularly into the life of Abraham as told in the book of Genesis. Paul calls this, he says he makes his appeal, right, in verse 21. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? So he is about to relay the story of Abraham, which is in the book of Genesis, which is part of the first five books of the Bible, which is properly known as the Torah in Hebrew, right? It is the law. He considers this not only history, but law, and rightfully so. Because in the Torah, in even the history books of the Torah, God is making promises. And because God's word will not return to him void or unfulfilled, what he promises now has legal bearing, and it must come to pass. So not only is this the history of Paul's people, it is the law of God itself that must come to pass. So, in Genesis chapter 11, at the very end, the last three or four verses, we're introduced to Abraham. Now, in that particular passage, I don't have these uh, in, in, in the text. We're not going to spend that much time in the individual verses. Make a note. Go back and read them. Again, that's only a few chapters. You have nothing else to do on Sunday because there's no sports anymore. Okay? 
Genesis chapter 11, we meet Abraham and Sarah, although at this point in time, their, name, their names are Abram and Sarai. So if that throws you for a loop, why is this not Abraham? This dude's name is Abram. It's because God hasn't changed his name to Abraham yet. Still the same dude. In Genesis chapter 11, we see Abraham leaving his country called the Ur of the Chaldees. It's basically Babylon. If you know that term, Babylon, great. Now, some of you may know this story very well, and you're like, oh, this is review. Some of you may be like, who the heck's Abraham? I don't know where you are, so we're going to go through the whole thing. Very quickly, half a page of notes, we're going to go the entire story of Abraham. Okay, so Abraham in Genesis chapter 11 is drawn out of his land, and we see in the beginning of chapter 12 of Genesis, why? Because God says, you, Abraham, come out of your country, leave behind your family, leave behind your idols, leave behind your religion, leave behind everything that you once knew. You're my dude. I'm going to make a mighty nation out of you. I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to give you descendants. Now, at this point in history, Abraham is 75 years old. His wife has been barren their entire life. And you've got to imagine Abraham's like, this is a good deal, right? God told me I'm going to have many descendants. I mean, it took a long time. Didn't happen according to my plan. Sarah's been barren for a long time. She's 65 at this point. But hey, if God says it, it's got to be good, right? Yeah. Genesis 15, three chapters later, God again promises descendants as numerous as the stars of the sky. Yeah, Abraham's not 75 anymore. I don't know how old he is, but he's older. And he looks up at the sky and he's like, man, God, I believe you. And I sound like a fool for believing you that my old body is gonna produce as many descendants as the stars. God, you, got, you must got something cooking up, you know, some kind of scheme, but this is good. And it says specifically in Genesis chapter 15 that Abraham believed God and he was accounted righteous. Paul talks about this in uh, Romans chapter 4, where this is the moment of Abraham's justification, the moment he's quote unquote saved and born again. He has believed God and God has declared him not guilty. It's a significant moment in history. Now, at the end of chapter 15 is one of the most remarkable instances where God himself makes a covenant to Abraham, but not with Abraham. Okay? He says, Abraham, I am going to give you a land. I am going to give you descendants. Here, prepare the sacrifices and then go to sleep. And Abraham goes into a deep sleep. And in this, he sees God in the form of a torch. Fire is very important in the in Bible's imagery and symbolism of the presence of God. This flaming torch in a burning oven floats or walks or somehow meanders through the cut up animals. And Abraham's like, I'm tripping. I don't know what I'm seeing, but I see this fire and I know that fire is God. And he himself is walking through these animals. And if you don't know biblical imagery and symbolism, you're like, what in the world is going on right now? Well, that was part of the covenant-making process, the cutting process, where when covenants were made between individuals, one of them would walk through the cut-up animals, saying, if I fail in my end of this agreement, let me be like these animals. Let me be cut in half like this heifer. Let me be mutilated like this bird. Let me be torn asunder like this lamb. I must be destroyed if I fail. You see the imagery now. God himself is walking through, as it were, these animals, saying, Abraham, I am making a covenant to you, but a covenant with myself. That if I fail to bring about the promises to you, let me, the unchanging one, be changed. If I do not bring you the descendants as numerous as the stars that I promised, if I do not bring you into a land, let me, the immutable one, suffer mutation which in case you don't know the theology of immutability, it's impossible for God to change. He says in his word, I do not change. Okay? So what we see is we see an assured promise between the persons of the Trinity to bring about this promise to Abraham. Abraham is a passive beneficiary of this great promise. He's asleep. Okay? Yet God is promising to do a work, and that work will not fail. So enter Genesis chapter 16. Abraham's now 86 years old, okay? And Abraham's like, it's been 11 years. 
I know God promised. I know I saw him walk through those animals, but I ain't seeing no children yet. Sarah's still barren. I'm still not a father of many nations. And Sarah's like, well, what are we not doing, Abraham? I have an idea. Take my handmaiden, Hagar. Go into her, have a kid with her, and that will be the first of your many sons. And Abraham's like, well, since you said so, I guess I gotta do it. And he does, he goes in and Hagar has a child. The child is Ishmael. Ishmael was not the promised son. Hagar was not the woman that God was going to work through. But this was Abraham's best efforts. This was Sarah's best efforts to facilitate God because somehow the sovereign God needed their help. Now, he has, he has all in the control. You know, he's keeping creation going. He's promising he's doing all this. Let me be cut asunder, Abraham. But I need your help, bro. I need you and Hagar to do what I need done. Genesis chapter 17. Abraham is now 99 years old. He has one son, Ishmael. But God comes again and promises that Sarah will be the mother of the promised child. Sarah's 89 at this point. And Abraham's like, all right, God, if you say that Sarah is going to be uh, the mother, I, I guess you, you, you don't lie. You, you must be accurate. You must be telling me the truth. But that's not what I expected. And God's like, I know. So look at Ishmael. Trust me. Believe in my promise. I will work through you and Sarah. Because at this point, Hagar is a young lady. Hagar can have kids. Sarah's not a young lady. She's been barren her whole life. Certainly, you don't expect to get pregnant at 89. Certainly, you don't expect to get pregnant when you're 99 and your wife's 89. But God promises that Sarah will be the mother and she will name him Isaac. And the covenant that God made with Abraham back in Genesis 15, the covenant of promise, it will continue through Isaac. So Ishmael was never going to be the recipient of this covenant of promise. He was never going to be the one that God was working through. He was never going to be the one that would result in the descendants as numerous as the stars or as plentiful as the sand on the seashore. Ishmael was the works of the flesh personified, the efforts of humankind personified. It was not, he was not the son of promise. He was not the one through the spirit would work. Genesis 18, Abraham is now 100. It's been a year later. God himself comes and eats a meal with Abraham and says, remember how I told you that Sarah was going to be the mother and you're going to have a son through her and it's Isaac. And he's going to be my dude, just like you are my guy. He's the next in line. And Sarah overhears it this time. And she laughs. And God calls her on it. He's like, girl, why are you laughing? Oh, I'm not laughing. Yes, you are. I'm God. I know. Why are you laughing? Oh, I'm old, God. What do you expect from me? I can't, I can't possibly. I'm 90 years old. How am I going to have a kid? This time next year or the time of life, so nine months, I will return and you will be holding Isaac. And his, Isaac's name means laughter. See, you know, God planned that like ahead of time. He knew that, that Sarah would laugh and mock him. And the irony is every time she would hold her baby, she would be reminded that God does what God wants to do, how God wants to do it. And he didn't need her permission or her help. But it still would result in her laughter and her joy also important that Sarah had to be told personally by God about how this was going to go down. Right? I mean, you know, like at 90 years old, Abraham comes to her, baby, God said we're still having a baby, and it's through you. Yeah, right. <laughs> go back out to the field with your animals. But no. God told her directly, you will be the mother. Now, in Genesis chapter 21, Isaac is born. And as promised, the son of promise comes through God's power alone. God opens her womb. God miraculously brings about a child from the empty, barren womb of Sarah. He is born. His name is Isaac. And all is well, right? Just nothing but rejoicing and nothing but happiness. And everybody's just so happy because now the son of promise is here. Now the inheritance guy is here. Now everyone's going to be on board except for Hagar and Ishmael. 
And as Isaac is brought up, Ishmael begins to persecute Isaac and hate Isaac because Isaac is now the inheritor, and he is not. Isaac is the son of his father's affection, and he is not. And the conflict there begins. And if you don't know, Ishmael is, the, is, the, is like the, the great, 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 great grandfather of the people who would now be known as Arabs. The same conflict that is existing today in the Middle East between Palestine and the Jewish people started with Ishmael and Isaac, and it has never ceased. And until Christ returns, it will never cease. So we can want peace in the Middle East all you want, but that peace is not going to come until Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, returns. Amen. Because this has been a conflict, it is a conflict, and it will be a conflict until God comes and puts conflict to rest. Amen. Now, all of this to be said, right? We just went through 10 chapters of Genesis, right? That was, that was quick. That's 10 chapters. You can do that. No problem. All of this, we tend to look at the rest of the Old Testament in the same way and say, I don't care about the Old Testament, Lee. <laughs> it's a running joke. It's okay. <laughs> I don't care about this stuff. It's boring. It has no purpose. It has no relevance to me. I don't understand why I need to study the Old Testament. Well, why you need to study the Old Testament is because it tells us who God is. The Old Testament reveals the character of God in the same way that the New Testament does. But in fact, because it covers more of redemptive history, it allows us to see a bigger picture of who God is. There is nothing that illustrates the sovereignty of God more than the story of Abraham. The fact that its scripture says it is God who opens and closes the womb. There was a reason that Sarah went 90 years of her life with no children, suffered unending disgrace from her peers, was mocked and humiliated by her own handmaiden because she could not have a child. It is because God wanted that child to come when he came by his power so he would receive the glory and show that he has purposed and planned this whole thing. So the times of suffering... The times of trial that you endure are within God's control. There is nothing that is outside of God's control. There is nothing outside of God's plan. And one of the things that would be very timely for us as Christians to remember is that even suffering is ordained by God. Just because we're believers does not mean we are free from suffering. Some of you may suffer during this time with this virus. Some of you may suffer after this has passed and the next cataclysm comes for our culture. Suffering is a natural part of living in a fallen world and the children of God are not excluded from that suffering. If we think that we must have no suffering to be free from all this trial to, in order to be the sons and daughters of God, then we've got a serious dissonance here with the Bible because the apostles suffered. God's prophets suffered. Jesus, the perfect, spotless, sinless Son of God, suffered betrayal, suffering, and death. All as part of God's ordained plan. Who's, who's encouraged already? Yeah, yeah, that's how I do it. Right. Talking about the suffering. But here's the thing. If we don't understand that life is going to be filled with suffering, yet God is good in the midst of those sufferings, and God is sovereign over those sufferings, we can understand that he can accurately say in his word, in Romans 8.28, all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. All things. Not just good things. All things. Now, the all things aren't good. Some of them are really, really bad. You know, the Apostle James being thrown off the top of the temple and then clubbed to death with a big stick is not a good thing in and of itself. But it led to the conversion of some of those who clubbed him to death. In the same way that Stephen being martyred was a significant moment in redemptive history when Paul, who was Saul, named Saul at that time, was consenting to his death. And later that man would be instrumental in the spread of the entire gospel that he once tried to persecute. Do not be afraid of times of suffering. They're going to be there. They can even be really, really bad. But you have a really, really good God who is in control and sovereign over everything. A God who is so sovereign that he can direct the entire course of a nation, the Hebrew people. 
He is so sovereign, in fact, that in that moment when Abraham is asleep and he's going through the fire in Genesis 15, he can say, Abraham, your descendants are going to go into slavery in Egypt for 400 years. And it's part of my plan. And they're going to suffer. Your descendants will suffer. But they're going to go down to 70, and they're going to come up as a multitude of close to 2.5 million people. How's that for a down payment on the stars and the sky and the sand by the seashore? And this is through my sovereign working, Abraham. And I'm going to bring it about how I want to bring it about so that I will glorify myself as I desire to be glory. And guess what, Abraham? I'm going to do this, and you are going to rejoice in it. Because only I can do what I'm going to do. And you will celebrate that, and you will rest in that. And you know what Abraham did? Scripture says he went to his grave happy, full of old age. And that's a biblical way of saying he had a good life. He had a lot of suffering in his life, but he had a good life. Now, if it was just this life that mattered, just a good life here that mattered, Abraham wasn't so lucky. Because a lot of the promises that God made did not see their ultimate fulfillment in Abraham's life. Because when God said, your descendants will be as numerous as the stars in the sky or as the sand of the seashore, he did not mean physical descendants. He didn't mean biological sons and daughters. He meant the spiritual sons and daughters, those who would come to faith through Jesus Christ. Well, Mike, how can you say that? That's just kind of, isn't that kind of, you know, brushing over where God failed? No, because this was God's intention plan from the beginning. And how do I know that? Well, because Paul says so. Paul's an apostle. He speaks with the authority of God. But in this particular passage that everyone wants to skip over because they don't understand it, he makes a quote of the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 54. We're going to get there in a second. I don't want to rush ahead. But he is drawing reference to the fact that the barren will shout. Right? The one without child will have a multitude of children. We'll get there. We'll get there. So in verses 21 through 26, Paul's making this argument about about. Hagar and Sarah, Isaac and Ishmael, these two families, these, these, these two halves of one family, these two covenants, and in fact, these things are symbolic or allegorical, your Bible might say, depending on what English translation you're in. Don't get freaked out by the word symbolic. Don't get freaked out by the word allegory. The word in Greek simply means when Paul says, these things are allegory. These things say one thing, actual history, but they also mean something much more a spiritual dimension behind that history that has so much more meaning than simply one spouse and one maiden and one son and another son. There's more to it than that. The history of God's promise to Abraham serves to show the promise of God does not come through human effort and attempts. This has been the story, the heartbeat through the entire book of Galatians is, are we justified by God's grace through faith in Christ, or are we justified by our efforts and faith? Remember, no one is saying you're saved purely by my adherence to the law. They're saying faith in Jesus and being a good Christian. But that is still something beyond faith alone. If it's faith plus anything, you have nothing, right? That's how we understand the true Christian faith. And man's efforts, however intelligent, however zealous, however, you know, however good we try, are still only man's efforts. Jesus in John chapter 3 verse 6 says, flesh can only produce flesh, spirit will produce spirit. It is a very important verse. And in the context, he's talking to Nicodemus about the new birth, about being born again, about being born from above by spirit. He's telling Nicodemus, your flesh, your works, your efforts, your hands, your behavior, your adherence to the law, all of that will only produce more flesh. There must be the move of the spirit for there to be a new spirit. You must be born again, Nicodemus. You must be born from above. And the wind blows where it will, talking of the Spirit of God. We don't see it, but we see its effects. We don't know how God moves. We can't see how God moves sometimes, but we can see the effect of how God moves. In the life of Abraham, what did works of the flesh achieve? Nothing but hatred, conflict, and violence. Hagar and Sarah had conflict. Isaac and Ishmael have conflict. Isaac and Ishmael's descendants are still having conflict. The works of the flesh, best human efforts, only ever produce death. 
takes sovereign grace. It takes the working of the spirit for there to be anything but death. But when God moves in grace and when God moves by the power of his spirit, he brings one thing that my best effort, my best works can never bring. He brings life. He brings spiritual life. He brings new birth. Now, an important thing in this text, when he says in verse 24, these things are symbolic, for there are two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar, for this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is. What he's saying here is there is a covenant that God made. And it's according to the flesh. It's according to the things that are being done by the individuals in it. He referenced this in chapter 3. This is the covenant God made with Moses. This is an attempt to be justified. This is an attempt to come close to God. This is an attempt to win God's favor by my effort, my adherence to the law. But then he in, in, implies that there is another covenant, which corresponds with Jerusalem, which is from above. And if we look at the parallel between John chapter 3 about being born from above, and we see Paul talking about the Jerusalem, which is from above, and talking about having to be born as sons of promise, we see that what he's talking about is he's comparing and contrasting Judaism and Christianity. He's talking about works versus grace. He's talking about law versus gospel. But an important point, if you remember back to verse 21 of chapter 3, Paul never implies that these two covenants, these two systems are at odds. Chapter 3, verse 21, Paul records, Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly the righteousness would have been by the law. So the point is, is the law is not in conflict with the gospel, unless you're trying to be saved by the law. The law is not bad. The law has a purpose. The law has a purpose for you now, New Testament believer. It is not that we believe in grace and we cast off the law. It is that we now look at the law as its intended purpose. It, I cannot be saved by the law. I am in need of a savior. Christ comes with his gospel message. I apply that gospel. I yield to that gospel. I hear that gospel. But now what do I do with the law? The law guides me. The law tells me what is sinful. The law tells me what God finds pleasing. The law and the gospel work in a beautiful symphony together as long as I understand one very important thing. The aim of the law was never to save. The aim of the law was to show me how much I needed a savior. Amen. Just like Ishmael was never going to be the son who would inherit. Ishmael would never be the son of promise. Ishmael only came as a result of Abraham and Hagar trying to work really hard to bring about God's plan. Whereas, on the other hand, God works sovereignly through Sarah, through his spirit, through the promise to bring about the one who would be the inheritor, to bring about the one who was the son of promise. Now, in the church in Galatia, these two views are in conflict. We see, in one sense, people trying to, 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 to continue in their efforts, to, to secure by their efforts the love and favor of God. They are, in effect, they are being Sarah or Hagar and Abraham. They are trying really hard to do the thing that God said he would do. And in the other sense, there's some Galatians who are trusting in faith alone because of Christ alone, by God's grace alone, and they are believing and they are affirming that only God can do what God said he's going to do. They're Sarah and they're Abraham. But the problem is, is these two things cannot coexist. Both interpretations cannot be true. This is a very important point, too, when you're reading your Bible, right? Everyone in this day and age is, well, that's your interpretation. This is my interpretation. We've all got our own interpretation and they're all equally valid no they're not there is only ever one interpretation for a passage in the scriptures there can be many applications and there can be many implications in a passage but god cannot mean two separate opposite things in one passage he can't, you can't look at John 3, 6, for example, where it says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit of the, is of the spirit, and say anything other than flesh will only make flesh, 
Spirit will only make spirit. You can't say, well, that's fine for you, Mike, but my interpretation is if I really, really mean it, if I'm really sincere in my belief, then my belief of flesh will equally make spirit. I do not get to determine what the interpretation is. The scriptures interpret, determine the interpretation for me. So when I see this passage in John chapter 3, that flesh only produces flesh and spirit only produces spirit, and I'm like, but what about those people I know who may not believe in Jesus, but they're really sincere in their belief? They really trust in, in, in Allah. They really trust in Krishna. They really trust in Buddha. They really believe, suckers, that they're good people. Yeah, because they're not. Remember, we talked about this last week. There ain't nobody good but Jesus. Sorry. What? But they're really sincere about it. They really believe it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is the truth of what the Bible affirms, that unless the Spirit of God does this work, there is no spiritual rebirth. It doesn't matter how sincere you are. It doesn't matter how much you really want it to be true. Just like when we read in the Scriptures that there is no other name under heaven by which men must be saved other than the name of Jesus Christ. That is not an opportunity for me to insert a parenthesis, except if they really, really love whatever else, except if they really, really mean it, except if they've never heard the name of Jesus. Let that one sink in for a second. That does not excuse someone for being judged by God if they've never heard the name of Jesus Christ. Romans 1, we are all without excuse. Well, then what about that person? I feel really bad. Good, go be a missionary and preach the gospel to them. I mean, you're out of work now, right? <laughs> Ain't nobody working with the coronavirus. Go preach the gospel to someone. Go to your neighbor. You never talked to him before. Great. Keep social distancing, six feet, but proclaim the gospel to them. Right? And just, because, just because we're uncomfortable with the truth does not make it any less true. And not that we get to make that call. Anyway, that was way off notes. Let's go back here. All right. Verse 27. Here's our quote from Isaiah 54. This is what I was alluding to earlier. Paul says, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. You're like, what the heck, Paul, are you talking about? Now, I'm sure there's at least one of you who never bothered to look down at the bottom and see the little A or 1 and see where this footnote comes from, but it comes from Isaiah 54. Now, you're like, oh, Isaiah 54. Yeah, of course I know Isaiah 54. You may have never read Isaiah 54. That's okay. But what is very, very important in a passage I highly, highly recommend every single one of you read is Isaiah 53. If you do not know what Isaiah 53 is, good luck, I'm going to tell you. It's the suffering servant. It is the prophecy about how Jesus, as the Messiah, as the suffering servant, will be the one whom the Father sends, and it is the Father's will and desire to crush him, that by his stripes we would be healed from sin. He would be bruised for our iniquities, crushed and chastised for our sin had a great opportunity to quote that and mess it up. But anyway, that is the passage that tells the great story that there is one coming who will suffer, he will die, he will be buried, and it is entirely, purely the plan of God the Father to do so. Why? And in verse 12 of Isaiah 53, he tells us the plan. That my people will be redeemed from their transgressions. And that's how it ends. Talk about a, boy, a terrible chapter end, right? Well, that was a downer. He's going to die. But then Isaiah 54 comes in. I'm going to turn there real quick. Mm -hmm. If you feel like turning to Isaiah 54, turn with me. If not, just listen to me yell. You'll be able to hear it. Isaiah 54. Okay. So the very last line of verse 12. Now I'm actually quoting. This is actually the scriptures. And he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors, which flows directly into the next passage, the next line, which the, uh, the prophet says, Sing, O barren, you who have not borne. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not labored with child. For more are the children of the desolate than, that, than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent and let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare, lengthen your cords, and strengthen your stakes. 
For you shall expand to the right and to the left, and your descendants will inherit the nations and make the, des make the desolate cities inhabited. Now, Paul doesn't put all three verses in, right? He just puts one in. But this is where Paul is coming from. So Isaiah 53 ends with, the suffering servant's mission ends with, he will redeem many. And then what happens? Singing happens. Praise happens. Exaltation of the Lord happens because in the redeeming work of the suffering servant, not only now is Israel, is God's ethnic people going to be redeemed, but in fact, they're going to expand so much that they have to open up their tents. They have to run new cords and new stakes and expand to the right and to the left because so many people are going to be brought into the people of God through what? Through the work of the suffering servants. This was the plan of God all along. The plan of God all along was to work through one particular people at a particular time in a particular nation, the Jewish people. And when the Messiah came from that particular people, he would open up the tents, as it were and the inheritance would be the nations. Remember how God promised Abraham back in Genesis chapter 12 and Genesis chapter 15 and Genesis 21 that through you, Abraham, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Your sons will be numerous. You will be a father of many nations. You will open up your tents, Abraham. Are you seeing the connection here? This is the promise and the plan of God at work. And Paul is quoting this and saying, this has come to pass. Thanks to Pentecost, right? Acts chapter 2. It's not just a Jewish thing anymore. The nations have received this. The multitudes have received this. Jew and Gentile has received this and received it on the basis of what? Adherence to the law? Works of the flesh? No. Through faith in Christ is the fulfillment of the law the offering of my sin, the bearer of God's wrath, and the resurrector of many brethren. Jesus is the completion and the, and, the, and, the, and the ultimate aim of every promise that God has made to his people, and he has accomplished it. And our response, besides saying, thank you, Lord, I accept this, is we should break forth in singing because now we have been brought in and expanded in to the kingdom of God. Now, that leaves one little problem, though. Jump back to Galatians 4. Verses 28 through 31. Now, we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. So, Paul is affirming that you, believer, by your faith in Christ and his work, are a child of promise, son or daughter of the kingdom. Verse 29. But he... But as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, even so it is now. You're going to be persecuted for your belief in Christ. You may not be persecuted like the Galatians were. You may not be persecuted like the church was by Rome. You must, might just be made fun of by your friends and family. They might think you're foolish. They might think you're a moron. They might think you're crazy. But it is still what God has said is going to happen. Because why? Why do people react so strongly against your Christian belief? Now, if you're just a jerk, that's you. I can't speak to anything biblical about that. Don't be a jerk. Love your neighbor. If, however, what you are doing is faithfully calling people to repent of their sin and trust in Christ, the reason you have conflict, the reason that there is a persecution that will rise up against you is people do not want to hear that they are sinful. And they certainly want, don't want to hear that they will be held accountable to God, the just judge. And at the end of the day, really what they don't want to hear, and he missed it, Joe, I know. What they don't want to hear is that God is so good and holy that he must judge them because they are wicked. We are wicked. There is none good, no, not one, that Paul says. That will provoke people. That will cause a reaction in people. It will be an unpleasant thing. But the ultimate thing is not whether or not people like me, not whether or not I, people receive my message, but am I being faithful to Christ when he told me to go forth into all the nations and make disciples? Am I being obedient to my Lord who saved me? Do I desire to pe for people to be freed from the bondage of sin, to be freed from the danger of hell? Do I, do I want this or not? And if you can say, I want this, 
this is my heart for people, then you will endure that persecution. You will stand firm as a faithful soldier, like Paul says. You will endure the persecution with joy. Verse 30. Nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be an heir with the son of the free woman. He's quoting Sarah, just in case you didn't read the footnote. This was Sarah's command to Abraham. When Isaac was being persecuted by Ishmael and Hagar was getting all sassy with her, this was her command to her husband. Cast them out. They are not of the promise. They will not endure or they will not continue in persecution. We will have them out. And you're like, well, that's kind of mean, kind of unfair, right? Well, if we think again, these things are symbolic. These things are allegorical. What has happened here between the church in the early centuries and the Jewish people? The number one persecutor of Christians in the first century was not Rome. It was not Gentiles. It was Jews. Why? Because they were claiming that the inheritance that was given to the sons of Abraham was now given to the nations. And it was the most offensive message that you could offer. And they did everything they could to stamp it out, to crush this good news, to persecute and put down Christians. Remember, it was Jews who killed James. James was a Jew, by the way, too. So this wasn't like racial or ethnic. They just didn't like the message he was preaching. It was Jews who killed Stephen. It was Jews who killed John. Not, not John the Apostle, that John. John, the brother of James. It was Jews who killed Jesus because what they had bought into was a system of their own devising, a God of their own imagination who was perfectly fine with them. And not only was perfectly fine with them, but the only way for them to be perfectly fine with this God of their imagination was for them to follow the law to the letter and you got saved by works and you effort and you really tried and you had to be the right race and you had all of these external things into a false religion. And Paul's response is he quotes Sarah and says, cast out the bondwoman. What he's saying to the church in Galatia is you cannot have two different interpretations of how to be saved in your church. You must get rid of these false teachers. You must get rid of these Pharisees. You must get rid of people who are preaching legalism as the means of salvation. He's telling them you must clean your house if you believe that. If you believe in your own works, repent of that and trust in Christ and Christ alone. The two cannot last together. It's the truth. Look what happened in Galatia when Paul established a church on faith and faith alone, the gospel message. He leaves, false teachers come in, and what is happening? The church has been wrecked and been ruined. The church's only foundation is the revelation of who Jesus Christ is, the perfect son of God who died a perfect death that sinners who deserve death might have life. And we receive that through faith alone by God's grace. If we alter that message, the church dies. If we alter that message, the work of God dies. If we change what you must do to be saved, we are no better than, Isaac, or no better than Ishmael and Hagar, and we will be cast out. Let the, just let that thing sit, sit for a second. We must be faithful to what Christ has committed to us. We must believe the gospel as he presented it, not as we want it to be. Not as we want to, to stroke our own egos and feel good about my best efforts and my, my best attempts. And look at all the Bible studies I do and look at all the time I pray. And I've mem I memorized all these scriptures and all these external things. I was baptized six times and I did this and I did that. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. What matters is, do you believe in Christ as your atoning substitute, as your sacrifice, as your freedom from the law with all its cursing? Because Jesus Christ came to bring freedom from the curse of the moral law. He came to die that I might live. And he came to bring freedom from the ceremonial law of cleanliness, that because of his perfect life, I stand as one perfectly righteous in the sight of God, despite the fact that I am not. That is the truth, and that is the only truth that will sustain you. 
That is the only thing that you can cling to when everything around you in the world has gone to, to utter garbage is the fact that Christ has died for me. And I can cling to that no matter if I have no toilet paper, no matter if there's a disease ravaging, I have Christ, so I have everything. And not only has he saved me, but he has saved me for freedom, that I may now live for his glory. And that I may now walk out that freedom in the power of the spirit so that others may see me and glorify my Father in heaven. We're about to enter into chapter five next week. The first four chapters of this book have all been theological in nature, laying the groundwork, laying the, the indicatives of this is who you are because of the gospel. All you people who have been waiting for four months, what do I do? I know the, I know the series title rest, but what do I do? It's finally coming. You've endured the first verse of chapter 5. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by, by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. The first imperative or command that Paul gives you, believer, if you have been freed for the sake of freedom, do not be put back into bondage. Cast off every hope that you would bring to the table. Cast off every good work that you would cling to and cling to nothing but Jesus Christ and Christ crucified. Amen? Amen? That is the only hope you have in life. That is the only hope you have in death. That is the only thing that you need. Amen? Stand with me, please. That was just a cough because my throat is dry. <laughs> It's okay. <laughs> All right, let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the people who have assembled today under the gathering uh, and the proclamation of your word. I thank you for the confidence that we can rest in that you are sovereign. I thank you for those who have stayed home, who thought it wise and prudent to avail themselves of the means of technology to still hear the proclamation of your word. Lord, we proclaim to the world around us, through our words and through our deeds, what we truly believe in our heart. Let us be a people that proclaims you're good, you are sovereign, and you have a plan. And I pray that your spirit would move upon us to be bold in these times, to speak of Jesus Christ. To not merely speak in triviality, Lord, but to speak with confidence of the only truth that actually matters, the truth of the gospel. And Father, I also pray that when we are confronted by the unknown, we would go back to what we know. If the news tells us of terror, we would go back to what we know about you, that you are our rock and our strong tower. If that our friends and family speak of an incurable disease, we would go back to what we know, that you are the great physician who has truly healed us by dealing with our sin. And that we would have confidence no matter what, that you who gave your only son for us will, because of faith in Christ and by your grace alone, receive us to yourself one day, no matter what is happening here on the earth. Our ultimate hope and our great confidence is not even our faith, Lord, but your Son. And it is in him we rest, and it is in him we trust, and it is in him we pray for his glory. Amen. Amen. Just a reminder, we will keep you guys updated as the weeks go on with everything. But the plan is, until they shut us down, we will continue to gather for the proclamation of God's word. <laughs> We will also still be continuing our Wednesday night scripture study. We're not stopping that again until they force us to stop. So if you've got nothing better to do because you can't go anywhere, come out and study the Ten Commandments with us at 730 on Wednesday. Amen? Amen. God bless.